Okay, so uh, a historical sketch of dispensationalism, I'm not going to discuss much here. Um, uh, what is the significance of Darby for dispensationalism? I think it is explained here, but let me say, you know, there is a charge. There is maybe there is some kind of accusation saying that dispensationalism is something new. It is a discovery of Jay and Darby, right? So now you might ask, who is Jay and Darby? Uh, was maybe he was a Roman Catholic in the beginning and then became Anglican. Then he 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 became a brethren. Brethren. So uh, that's Jay and Darby's background. It's it is right. Jay and Darby is the one who maybe had played a huge role in, especially in the 1800s, uh, in formulating some of the tenets of uh, dispensationalism. So I say those things in the background about uh, the John Dar, you know, Jane Darby's <clears throat> influence. But, but saying that dispensationalism is a new thing, it's a new discovery, by J. and Darby, whereas covenant theology, covenant theology is very old, will not be a right accusation. For example, uh, covenant theology, the formulation of the covenant system, like uh, as I said, three covenants. Remember, covenant of works, covenant of covenant of, covenant of redemption, covenant of work and grace. This is actually uh, can be attributed to Bullinger uh, and Olivanius. And especially, uh, you know, I don't know how to pronounce this word. Pronounce this one, uh, um, I don't know. It's something like Cocaeus or something. All right. So actually, covenant theology or formulation of covenant theology actually began in the 16th century and early 17th century. So even covenant theology was not a system of theology that was that was followed from the beginning. So, so I am, am what I'm saying is uh, there is an argument against dispensationalism where it says dispensationalism is a new thing, whereas covenant theology is old. You know, I don't I think not much a difference between. So please, what do you do when you get some time? Please look into the history. I'm not going to spend uh, much time here. Um, about the history. I have given the history in, in quite a bit of detail here that you can look at, all right? And even what are, how, uh, what is the role that Darby had, right? Okay, so, uh, and what is, how, now I wanted to say, dispensationalism as such has this latest century, this uh, uh, dispensationalism is spread because of certain institutions, for example, Dallas Theological Seminary, is very important to note the, the, the place of Dallas Theological Seminary in the uh, spread of dispensationalism, especially Lewis Sperry Schaefer. All right, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, who was the president of Dallas Seminary uh, and who was a disciple of a Schofield. You know Schofield. Schofield uh, is known for his uh, known for his um, study Bible. So yes, uh, uh, Ellis Schaefer or Lewis Perry Schaefer and Schofield, and then there is a uh, some other people like. Uh, uh, J. Dwight Pentecost, John Wildwood, Charles Ryrie, uh, all of these people are very uh, influential in spreading dispensationalism, right? Spreading dispensationalism. Uh, and some of the uh, college in olden days, well, you know, institutions that were prominent were Gordon College, Moody Bible Institute, Practical Bible Training College and Bible Institute of Los Angeles. You know, so here is a list of names. All right. So these, all of these um, 
institutions where in, a, in the olden days were very famous for dispensational teachings. Right then, now what are the institutions? Probably um, Master Seminary, Central Baptist Seminary, Baptist Bible, Faith Baptist, and Detroit Baptist Seminaries are all are important institutions right now. Um, who still teaches dispensationalism? Um, and uh, happy to say, you know, I I graduated from uh, the seminary uh, a few years ago. So, yes, there are many institutions that teach. So, uh, I am basically a dispensationalist. I, I look at the Bible, not in terms of covenant, but in terms of seven dispensations. Right? So, we are going to look at that one. Now, let's look at irreducible minimum of dispensationalism. Basically, what are the main features of dispensationalism. Now, uh, first of all, I wanted to say what dispensationalism is not. All right. Don't uh, think that, okay, dispensationalism is, uh, you know, talking about seven periods of history. Now, that's not the thing. There are some people might have three or five or even some has got nine dispensations. You know, people divide various ways. So it, the important thing is not that because somebody has got nine or five or seven. All right. Uh, that's not the main thing in the uh, dispensations. Uh, and I also say here dispensation is not downwardly spiraling series of failures. Uh, like if there is a charge something like this, you know, God said, uh, God planned something, revealed something, man failed, so God started again something new. Even that is not what really dispensation. So that's the main thing that I said. And I also say here, point number three, dispensationalism is not merely premillennialism or pre-tribulationalism. Uh, Okay, since you are studying here in this institute, you need to know what is premillennialism. Okay, can anyone is able to comment now what is premillennialism? Can anyone comment? What is premillennialism? Anyone? Can anyone say? Hmm? Or what is pre-tribulationalism? Before the second coming, sir. Okay. Um, the rapture time for second coming, right? Mm -hmm. thousand, thousand years. Okay, yes. Yes, Pastor, I think Pastor was Joseph was saying it's right. Premillennialism means, means Jesus will come before, look at the word pre- Jesus will come before millennium. So millennium means, you know that, right? Thousand years. That's what millennium. So pre-millennium means Jesus will come to this earth before millennium, before thousand years rule. Okay, that is pre-millennium. All right? So pre means before. Premillennialism means before thousand years. That's a technical meaning. The, the idea is Jesus will come before thousand years. And what is then pre-tribulationalism? Well, you know, of course, we are, going to, we are going to study this in our eschatology in detail, right? In our systematic theology, we are going to study it, but I'm just asking, what is then what would be pre-tribulationalism? Can anyone anyone uh, say what is pre-tribulationalism? Okay, I will tell you. Uh, so you know that pre means before, right? Before. Tribulation means tribulation. So before tribulation, before tribulation, what will happen? The idea is, okay, question is when 
will rapture happen? When will rapture happen? Before tribulation or after or at the end of tribulation or in the mid midpoint of tribulation? So, so there are three views for that. So pre-tribulation means rapture will happen before tribulation period. Right? There are seven years of tribulation. Right? So that is what pre-tribulation is. What I'm saying here is dispensationalism is not merely premillennialism or pre-tribulationalism. Yes, yeah, those are important, but they are not the essential tenets of uh, dispensationalism. Or um, uh, dispensationalism is not a particular view of sanctification. This is, um, uh, you know, uh, the question is of sanctification because there are times uh, older dispensationalists believed for example, I have given a few examples here that um, sanctification in anti differs from the Old Testament. All right. That is, some people said, especially sanctification is no longer mere obedience to the law, but yielding to the Spirit's new ministries of indwelling and filling. This was some understanding. I'm saying I don't think in that way. This is not my understanding, but there are some dispensations think that in the Old Testament, sanctification was based on the obedience, but in the New Testament, it was spirit yielding to the spirit. That was some theologians wrote. So I am saying, yeah, but that is not the basic things of dispensation. And let me also say, dispensation is while few dispens uh, dispensations have exceeded Kesek uh, theology and abandoned repentance for the acknowledgement of Christ's Lordship as essential salvation proper, even these are not the advocate of advocates of licentiousness. Yeah, that is right. Among dispensationalists, some are Kesek group. I think uh, Kesek, uh, about Kesek theology, I have. The other day, I explained a little bit. I will take some time to explain in detail sometime in the future. But understand, um, Kesik theology argued for non-lordship salvation. At least, you know, some sense, non-lordship salvation. Right? Yeah, um, non-lordship. That is, you can be saved without receiving Christ as your Lord. It means you don't need to repent from your sin to be saved. That was Kasek theology. So please understand that one. Uh, dispensationalism should not be understood in terms of Kasek theology because there are a lot of dispensationalists who do not believe in Kasek theology. Now, then there, there is the other one, Armenianism. Yeah, uh, we are going to learn about all of this group. Pelagian, semi-Pelagianism, Armenian, and Calvinism. All of them we are going to learn when? We are going to learn that in our soteriology. And I am not an Armenian. I think by this time, if you know the difference between Armenianism and Calvinism, then you will, might have understood that I'm not an Armenian. Right? And But I'm saying there are accusations. Okay, dispensations are Armenians. Yes. There are Armenians in dispensations camp, that is true. But there are Calvinists, even five point Calvinists in dispensations. For example, John MacArthur, I think he is a five point Calvinist. You know, the reason why I would mention his name is that he's one of the famous, uh, you know, pastors. This, this, in this period, in who is in the U.S. who teaches and preaches God's word properly, I would say. So, dispensationalism is not Armenian. Then, what it is? That is the main thing that I needed to focus today. What is dispensationalism? What are the main tenets of dispensationalism? 
Okay. And that I wanted to say, <clears throat> number one, a belief that Bible contains multiple census terms like Israel and seed of Abraham. Believe in understanding what is Israel and seed of Abraham. For example, in the Bible, Israel is Israel means two ways, right? Of course, every time Israel means it is ethnic Israel, right? It is ethnic Israel. Israel means Jewish people. Now, but when it comes in the New Testament, it can mean Israel as ethnic and spiritual Israel. All right, let me let me ask a question. What is a spiritual Israel? Here is a problem, right? Some people would misunderstand and say, spiritual Israel means church. No. Spiritual Israel is not church. Spiritual Israel means, you know, saved people from Israel. Saved Jewish people. Saved Jewish people are spiritual Israel. Right? So that because the, 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 uh, the word Israel can mean broadly, but when Bible says, when, when we use the word spiritual Israel, um, it, it, it means saved. Because that is, what Rom, uh, that is what Romans chapter 9 verse 6 actually tells us. All right? Israel is a two group. Now, Second, the seed of Abraham. Who are the seed of Abraham? Yes, refers to physical descendants of Abraham in most cases. Right? In most cases, they are physical descendants. Right? Let's look at this verse. Can, can we read this verse? Um, John chapter 8 verse. Yeah. Please open your Bibles. John chapter 8, verse 33. 8, 33. Yeah. They answered him, Were Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone? How can you say you will be made free? Okay, look at verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so what, what, what you need to understand here is that this is talking about Pharisees. Who are Pharisees? Pharisees are seed of Abraham. So we know they are the believers. They are not even believers, right? Uh, they are not, not, not even believers, but yes, seed of Abraham can include what? Jewish people. Jewish people who are not believers. But look at Romans 4.16. Look at Romans 4.16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, there we see uh, <laughs> that all uh, the, okay, yes, there is an Abraham offering, not only to those who are of the law, not only those who are under the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, right, which is, that means he, you know, he clearly Paul says now, yes, the children of Abraham can mean Jewish people, but here it means all believers. Children of Abraham means, and even Galatians says the same. All right, so understand um, what we mean. For example, Israel means two way we see, dispensationalists see Israel in two way, which is uh, number one, generally ethic, is, ethic Jews and within them 
there is a spiritual Israel or, or spiritual Israel. And seed of Abraham, we see in two ways. Number one, there is a Jewish people known as seed of Abraham, plus all those who believe like Abraham, including Gentiles, are called to be seed of Abraham. All right, that's a number one thing to remember because these are important uh, for us to realize. Second, <clears throat> all right, what is a second feature of dispensation? Also? Number two, believe that Old Testament covenant promises to Israel will be fulfilled for future national Israel. All right? What is that? Uh, uh, covenant promises, the promises that God made to Abraham, Moses, David, will be fulfilled for the future, in the future. For example, while the covenants are individually or generationally realized through the meeting of certain conditions, these covenants themselves are unconditional, right? Covenants in their self-evidently literal terms have not yet been fulfilled for historical Israel. Spiritual benefits alone cannot be suited for the social, political, geological, and economical benefits promised in the covenants. There are a lot of things in there. While dispensers will differ over the relationship of anti believers to the blessings of the Old Covenant, all agree that participation of the church in the fulfillment of the covenants is incidental to the fulfillment of the covenant promise to national Israel. What is that? <clears throat> the idea is this that we need to get. Yes, God has promised a, 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 a kingdom for Israel. I would let me put that way. Right? That involves land. Right? That involves land. God promised a kingdom for Israel. Through, for example, if you look at the look at the Abraham, you see there the, one of the major covenants. You have Abrahamic covenant, and then covenant that God made with Moses. Then there is a covenant that made with David. Right? These are the major covenants. And maybe there may be some people would say Palestinian covenant, right? That that may be an additional week. Some such, you know. Maybe we can accept it, yes. Palestinian covenant. So, these are the major covenants for Israel. Right? Major covenants for Israel. What are the things that involves in this covenant? This covenant involves a land for Israel. Right? And it involves, of course, when it comes to David, it involves a king in from the Davidic line, right? A king who will sit in Jerusalem and rule this land. Right? So there's a land is there, a king is there, right? And um, so that is going to be a, and that means that means a kingdom, right? A kingdom. So, land and a king is promised. <clears throat> so, dispensationalists believe that there will be a literal kingdom for Israel. That means when Jesus is going, when Jesus comes back, he will establish a kingdom which involves a land which has Israel. Okay, okay, Israel, let me put the word priority in that kingdom. All right, priority in that kingdom. All right, so that is an important thing. Covenant theologians do not accept it. Covenant theologians do not accept it. What do they say? Covenant theologians says, Church replaced Israel, right? 
Yes, Israel was there. Land was promised. These things are right now because of their rejection. Church took its place. Now, in God's program, there is no Jew, no Gentile. All are going to be same. Okay? That is what covenant theology says. But dispensationalists say, not like that. Yes, it is right. Maybe in eternity it is going to be like that. But millennial kingdom is there. Millennial kingdom is going to be different where Israel is going to be the favored nation of Jesus Christ because that has been promised in the Old Testament. So keep in your mind, if you ask what is the and one of the major differences between covenant theology and dispensationalism. Covenant theology, theologians believe that the promises in, in the Old Testament given to Israel, now because of the rejection of the Jewish people, church replaced, that means now church, that promises are for the church. Promises in the Old Testament are for the church. That is what covenant theologians believe. Whereas dispensationalists believe promises in the Old Testament are for Israel, not for the church. And that means whatever God promised in the Old Testament definitely will be fulfilled. And fulfillment is going to be in the millennial kingdom. Right? That is the Second main idea, and which I said, let me let me say that is repeated here. Uh, not I said promises, but uh, what I already said. But let me uh, say it again. A belief in the prominent future for national Israel. Dispensationalist means they believe. A priority or a prominence. Right. Prominence for Israel in the coming kingdom. All right. So <clears throat> that is also a very important. That means uh, here is a um, let me see. Okay. On the other, okay. See, Israel as the primary recipient of the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> so that means a kingdom is going to come who are the important people in the kingdom. It is going to be Israel. <clears throat> All right. Because the covenantal blessings are distinctive to them. Now, the question will be then what about the church? Right. What about the church? Yes, while the church plays a role in the kingdom, suddenly the kingdom itself is for Israel. Now then, what is going to be the, the role of the church? According to dispensationalists, uh, dispensationalists view that Jesus is the bride and church is the... Sorry. Uh, Jesus is the bridegroom, sorry, bridegroom, and church is the bride, right? That is the metaphor is used, and uh, dispensationalism explains that, yes, before the kingdom, it is actually a, a union happens, so rapture is taken as the union, and that means in dispensation, according to dispensationalism, in the millennial kingdom, Yes, Jesus is going to rule as the king. And that means church is going to be ruling with Jesus. Something like a king and a queen. Jesus is the king. Church is the queen. All right. So church is going to rule. Yes, rule over the kingdom. But the kingdom itself is for Israel. So that's how dispensationalists understand it. It's simply because dispensationalists view that Israel 
has a prominence in the kingdom. That means the kingdom is going to be this way. There will be Israel plus other nations. Because other nations are Gentiles, other nations will be part of the millennial kingdom. But Israel will have priority over other nations in the, uh, sorry, priority over other nations. That is, that is what um, a dispensationalist says or teaches, right? So I think you, I hope you understood what dispensationalism teaches about Israel's priority. There is a national priority for Israel in the millennial kingdom over other nations. Fourth feature of dispensationalism. Um, an approach to hermeneutics that demands that the Old Testament to be taken on its own terms and not interpreted in the light of the New Testament. All right. Covenant theologians would say, you write because of the New Testament and because of the New Testament priority, Old Testament has to be interpreted in the light of the New Testament. Right? In the light of the New Testament. So that what happened, that therefore many, many passages in the Old Testament were allegorized, spiritualized. It is simply because of the, because of the New Testament. So covenant theologians think that there is New Testament priorities there and Old Testament should be interpreted in light of the New Testament. Whereas dispensational says, no, no. <clears throat> you interpret Old Testament as it is given. All right? So that is, uh, you know, Ryrie would say, consistent literal hermeneutic. Well, that literal hermeneutic could be a, uh, is, a, is a target of much of ridicule because I've seen covenant theologians would attack Ryrie's explanation and they would say, for example, Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, <clears throat> Jesus um, talked about Herald uh, uh, something like new, a new fox. Okay, new, new, okay, sorry. Herald has new fox. Something like that, yeah. New thoughts. So, covenant theology and ridicule. Okay, so uh, you, you know, according to according to dispensationalist, Herod is actually a fox. You know, a fox with a with a tail and ear. You know, sitting on the throne and ruling. Because if you you if you want you have to take literally. So, if you want to take literally. That, that's what it means. No, that, see, that is a wrong understanding of literal interpretation. What is literal interpretation? It is, you know, look, reading a text normally as you read any book, for example, uh, according, to, according to its genres. For example, if it is a novel, you read it as a novel. If it is a short story, you read it as a short story. If it is simply a prose, a history, you read it as a history. And if it is a poem, poetry, poetical books, you read it as a poetical books. There should not be. That, but that also means that we read with, with the conventional principles of language. That is why. Yes. Any writing will have what? Figures of speech. Right? So literal interpretation does not mean that there are no figures of speeches or there are no poetry or there are no prophecy. 
That's, you know, that's not the way, but some people ridiculed it of the literal interpretation. But I'm saying, yes, uh, dispensationalism has this view that interpret Old Testament in its own way of like all, whatever the author intended, that's what it means. The meaning will never change for the Old Testament. You cannot change the meaning because of something is said in the New Testament. Okay? So, um, yes, I know that many might have allegorized Old Testament, right? Allegorized. You know, for example, now I, I will tell you, I will tell you, um, you know, there is a book in the Old Testament, Song of. Solomon, a classic example, Song of Solomon. What is Song of Solomon actually talks about? Can anyone say? Can anyone? It's a related, sir. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's a loving song some says is related to church and christ but uh, uh, in my understanding is uh, uh, love to husband and wife and divine love uh, as usual okay good any anybody else have any idea any any other any anything any other comments on song of solomon Yes. So traditionally, even Jewish people sometimes they they Jewish people interpreted Song of Solomon as as um, you know the love between God and Israel, All right? And so you see the theme of love there. And then it came. I know that even dispensationalists dispensationalists interpreted as the love between Jesus and the Church. Love between Jesus and the church. That means, similarly, everyone did what? Allegorized it. Right? Yes. Even all the dispensation, they all believed it. But I am not in that line. If I, when I, I'm saying a consistent literal interpretation. So, Song of Solomon, what is written there? That's what it means. And I am saying, as uh, yes, Pragas might you know indicated, I am saying that is that that is an explanation of a love love between a husband and wife. And the problem for people was that Song of Solomon had some kind of little bit of sexual connotations. And uh, you know how can God talk about it? That was a problem for many people. It was a problem for many people. Now you have to understand that for God, who gave the gift of sexual relationship with the human being, for God it was never unholy. For God it is holy. Yes, absolutely holy. When it happens within the boundary of marriage, within the boundary of marriage, right? Boundary of marriage. That means any sexual activities outside of the boundary of marriage is, is sin, according to the Bible, unholy. That's how the Bible explains it. So I'm saying, uh, that yes, uh, you know, maybe maybe when some people interpret it, they might talk about Jesus' love toward the church or whatever, maybe, but I, I think Song of Solomon simply means what it is written there. It is not right to bring our idea into the Bible. Because there it doesn't say anywhere that it is a, it is talking about uh, love between God, Yahweh and Israel. It doesn't say Song of Solomon 
is a reference to love between Jesus and the church. It doesn't say. If it doesn't say, then if we interpret it, we are bringing what is in our head or somebody taught that way and into the Bible, which is equal to AC Jesus. All right? So I am saying, I'm saying uh, here in point number four, a, you know, a literal interpretation of the Old Testament is one of the features. Yes, there are here and there people allegorize, but I'm saying, yeah, classical, in the classical dispensationalism, dispensationalism, literal interpretation is very, very important. Fifth, fifth feature of dispensationalism, right? Fifth, that is, church is different. Church is different from Israel. That the idea is that almost all the dispensations believe that church did not exist at one time and sprang into existence at some point in entity. That is what dispensations believe. Usually at Pentecost. Remember on the day of Pentecost. But there, for example, there are people believe that, yes, uh, church began when Jesus was baptized on, in the, you know, in Jordan River. Some people believe that. Some people believe that Jesus, you know, church uh, began right after the death of Christ. No, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Some people believe that church uh, began uh, in Matthew 16. Remember Jesus said, I will build my church. Or somewhere there after that. Um, or if, at least they say in Matthew 18, uh, where Jesus talked about church discipline. That means church is there. Some people believe that church began on the day of Pentecost. Right? Day of Pentecost. Some people believe the church began in Acts 13. Acts 13, where Paul and Barnabas was, you know, separated uh, for uh, mission, you know, mission work, ministry, church planting. Um, and there are even some people believe the church began only Acts 19, when Paul started to write these letters. So, yeah, there, you know, there are various uh, view among dispensationalists about when the church began. But one thing is certain. They all believe that church is different from Israel. Church is different from Israel. They all believe. All right? So that is the fifth. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, many people, even the big, big preacher, they said that the church is, in the Old Testament, uh, it is a, a church of symbol, but in the New Testament, it is a, uh, Israel's nations. So how Sorry, can sir. we just... Okay, one, let me... Uh, okay, uh, tell me one more time. What was the question? Some people preach uh, what? Many, many people said that Israel's people are the church of symbol in the Old Testament. Church, the new, te new church of symbol. The, yeah, church of symbol. The old Israel nation, their church of symbol. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, the real church, those are chosen people. So, okay. yeah. how can we bring this yeah, idea? Only, I think, you know, what uh, right now, not right now, what uh, we can, what I can say now is that we are going to have, a, uh, you know, when we discuss ecclesiology, we are going to talk about why why, why I don't believe that there was church in the Old Testament, right? It's something really new. Um, why I say church began on the day of Pentecost. There are theological reasons, right? That I will explain. But I don't think uh, Israel was a symbol of church. Uh, I don't think in that way because church is completely different. Right, Israel, yes, 
Remember, Israel is a nation. It's a country. It had, <clears throat> it had civil laws, as if you say yes, civil. And Israel was a theocracy, right? God was ruling it. So that means it, you know, God told them how to worship. So yes, sir, we sometimes we call ceremonial, right? How to do worship? Then, of course, like like all all the nation, there are moral codes. So some people call it moral law. Yeah, all these things were there. Were they, they, that means yes, there were true believers. They worship. It was a theocracy, it was a nation, it was a country, but that is not the church actually is. Right? Church is completely different. One of the ways it is different, for example, I will tell you, at least in my, uh, you know, looking at the scripture, Israel began, Jewish people began as a race, remember racial beginning? from Abraham. But as a nation, their inception is at Mount Sinai. When God gave them the law for the land. Right? That's, that's how we, we have to understand. Israel has to be a light for the nations, a representative of Yahweh to the nations. And they have the responsibility to, uh, you know, stand for God and his word. Yes, that's how Israel begins. And church, I think that is, that, you, know, you know, the birth of Abraham is not the beginning of the church. Church is completely different where church has, is, it is a group of born again believers Right, that means only who are saved. But Israel has got all people, believers and unbelievers alike. But church is a group of born again believers, number one, called out from different tribes and nations, you know, called out to be gathered together for participating in ordinances, right? Uh, you know, the ordinances makes church so distinct. What are the ordinances? That is baptism and Lord's table. Remember that. Too. So if you just look at what the church does, simply look at what the church does now, which will clearly tell us that's not what Israel has been doing. That's not what the Israel has been doing. So I am saying, no, I don't think church, Israel was ever a symbol of church. Why should it be? It's a nation. If it is a country, the uh, only difference between other country, uh, you know, uh, difference from other countries were, is that Israel was a theocracy. God was ruling through his agents. Remember, Moses was the first agent, Joshua, Judges, then Saul, David, Solomon, etc. Right? Th those were God's mediator, you know, we call mediators or a mediatorial head of the nations. But, but that's not what the church is. So I don't think there is any reason to see Israel as a symbol of church. No, Israel is not, Israel was not a symbol of church. Israel is, was a nation, and um, God ruled it. That is what I say. All right. Yes, sir. Many uh, good uh, big preachers also they are teaching the wrong the wrong teaching. It's coming to the believers. It's affecting the believers' life. That's what uh, we need to clarify that one, sir. Mm, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yes, there are, you know, the problem with the preachers is that they are, and I'm not a big preacher, but the big preachers are highly influential and they can sometimes influence people. And problem, you know, problem is that uh, 
um, with the big preachers, usually what happened, they, they began <laughs> most of the heretic, heretical doctrine. But, but let me say one thing. And because someone says Israel was a symbol of church, that may not be, that may not contribute to a heretical doctrine. I don't think. I don't think. But uh, still it is. Still, I don't think it is as such. I don't think Israel was a symbol of church. Israel is a nation. Church is a rather an or, organism, right? It, we call it is the body of Christ. It's a body, body of Christ. It's an organism uh, which includes all types of people, whether you are a Jew, whether you are a Gentiles, whatever maybe the tribe, whatever maybe the color cares, whoever it is, you're one. You're one. That's how it works. <clears throat> Let me also bring uh, the, the last one here, the sixth feature, right? Sixth feature of dispensationalism. Philosophy, history that exceeds soteriological issues and embraces whole of human existence, both material and immaterial. Yes, dispensationalism sees the universe as little different from covenant theology. And what is that? Yes, you know, uh, Ryrie would say dispensationalism has a doxological purpose, right? Because dispensationalism will always talk about God's glory, everything for God's glory. Now, let me say uh, that I don't think uh, this was a big tenet of dispensationalism because I have seen almost all the covenant theologians also have the same aim they also say that everything for god's glory god's glory is the most important thing yeah so that may not be a big thing but here is the thing here is the difference dispensation this uh put a, a significant emphasis on the idea of redemptive history they looked at the bible in terms of redemption or salvation as a centerpiece of god's plan Right, and that means they elevated soteriology at the end expenses of other emphasis in the historical outworking of God's program, right? Uh, but whereas dispensationalism, right, supports more of holistic philosophy of history that accounts better for features of our universe that fall outside our redemptive realm. That means uh, all the you know. Uh, the entire universe, even the nature, all the creation is accommodated in a dispensationalist understanding of the scripture. Right? All the animals, uh, you know, um, all the birds and you know, all the seas and everything is accommodated. Um, because remember, most of the dispensationalists would see the main center uh, piece in the Bible would be a kingdom of God. That means uh, it's not simply salvation. Uh, even other things have relevance and importance. Like all other creatures have relevance and importance in a dispensationalist understanding. Um, so that's how dispensationalists view. That means uh, it is it is clearly two lines. Covenant theologians look at the scripture in terms of redemptive history. Bible is a redemptive history. Right? Whereas dispensationalists would say, most of them, uh, it, no, it is much, it's far better say that the idea of kingdom is, will better suit the Bible because from chapter one onwards, the idea of ruling, reigning, begins and it, it goes on till the last two pages of scripture. So that's how, that's how another key differences. All right, I think uh, I will stop now. I've explained enough about, about uh, the key features of dispensationalism.